Good morning from sunny San Diego. My name is Julie Wartell, and my colleague Karen Schmerler and I developed this short video for LISC on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA. This is the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative. I previously conducted a knowledge sharing webinar on problem analysis for this program, and this is a follow-up focusing specifically on implementing problem analysis in small and rural jurisdictions. So what are we going to cover in this module? We're going to start with some special guests. I will be interviewing two police chiefs from small and rural agencies and their experiences with RVCRI and problem-oriented policing. After this, I will discuss what makes small and rural agencies and jurisdictions different, some common crime and disorder problems that many face, unique challenges to reducing and preventing crime, and then finish up with several resources. So who are our special guests? Chief Joseph Stamford from Ashland, Alabama Police Department and Chief Stephen Lowell from Oneida, New York Police Department. So let's get started with this discussion that we had. So both the Ashland, Alabama and Oneida, New York Police Departments are grantees of the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative Program, also known as RVCRI. The Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative is an effort funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, to provide funding and assistance to rural law enforcement agencies seeking to reduce violent crime and address problems associated with violent crime. Funding and support are available for implementing violent crime reduction strategies, improving investigations, improving services to victims, and for enhancing collaboration between local stakeholders. Serving as the training and technical assistance providers for this program are the National Policing Institute and the Local Initiative Support Corporation's Safety and Justice Team. NPI has supported the Ashland site with its project, while LISC has supported Oneida's grant efforts. So let's get started. With me today is Chief Steve Lowell from Oneida, New York, and Chief Joseph Stamford from Ashland, Alabama. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks we are going us. to uh, start with some introductory questions for both of you. Um, I'd like you to start by talking a, just a bit about your jurisdiction and the reason that you applied for RVCRI funding. So this is Chief Joseph Stamp with the Ashland Police Department. We're located in East Central Alabama um, in Clay County. We're a city of, of just under 2,000 citizens. Um, we don't have a, a major U.S. highway that runs through our, our county. And so that tends to reduce the amount of tax base that, that comes into our city. And um, the reason that, that we applied is because we, uh, we do have lack of funding, but we still have crime problems, violent crime issues within our city. And so we began looking for opportunities to address that violent crime using evidence-based strategies, including uh, problem-oriented policing and, and uh, other things we'll talk about today. So I have to uh, jump in here when I was talking to uh, the chief early on and talked about a small police department that I was working for and said 70 officers. He just laughed at me when he said, you don't know small. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Lowell. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, so the city of Oneida is located in central New York. We are 25, 30 minutes uh, from the city of Utica and also uh, 25, 30 minutes from the city of Syracuse, where we are between those two very large hub cities with uh, a couple of, well, the I-90 corridor runs through our jurisdiction. Um, and then uh, we have secondary roadways that run through our area as well. We are the only city directly between those two. Um, and we are surrounded by some other uh, municipal cities, but uh, 
we, we do have a, a rise in violent crime. Uh, we were recognizing that in 2019, 2020, and continue to escalate in 2021, leading us to seek some outside resources. Our city has about 10,500 people. Uh, we are an agency of 28 sworn from the chief down. And uh, we needed to engage our local resources. Uh, we needed to figure out a way and a strategy to change the way we were viewing what was happening in our area and also looking at what is allowing this to happen or the underlying causes of crime, what is leading to these crime problems. It's one thing to have a hunch about why these things are happening uh, in our area. And we all know that from work in the street and the reports that we write, but uh, there has to be a bigger issue because it didn't seem to matter how long we were going out and uh, targeting a specific area uh, for doing a blast of patrols in a certain area that that didn't have much effect in the, the weeks to come the, uh, based on what we were seeing internally. So we had to reshape and review and rethink how we were going to do what we needed to do. And um, that led us to apply for this project to give us further resources. We also have uh, a diminished economic base based on some flooding and things like that that affected our property tax value and uh, property taxes as a whole uh, due to FEMA buyouts. So uh, that's why we applied for the grant. Thank you. Back to you, Chief Stanford. So what specific crime problems are your RVCRI, uh, does your pre RVCRI project intend to address? Well, over a period of, of three or four years, we saw a huge increase in um, violent crimes to include um, robberies, uh, aggravated assaults. We even had in a small community like ours, we, we saw, we hadn't seen a, a murder in, in 20 years. And then all of a sudden we had four in our county. And so that that uptick, that increase in uh, violent crimes, uh, those those type A crimes that um, the UCR stats or, or uh, NIBRS are, is collecting, those are the ones that we saw a huge increase. And in, and my mayor and council actually come and said, why, why do we have such a big increase? Why are we getting these news reports? And, and so we started looking at the, the numbers and we, we were seeing a lot more reporting. And uh, so we realized that there must be an issue, that there must be a problem. Um, and so those are the problems. Those are the crimes that we we're looking to address, the, the violent crimes and trying to identify the, the violent offenders who were coming into our city and committing those crimes. Thank you. And uh, while I have you, uh, I have a few specific questions for each of you. So I'll start with Ashland. Um, what is your overall goal for incorporating POP into your agency? So again, um, we're a, a smaller agency. I have I'm fully staffed six patrol officers, an investigator, and myself. And so that makes eight patrol of, uh, eight sworn officers for a, a city of 1,984 citizens. By implementing problem-oriented policing, we would look to um, use the community to address the problems that they see as being the, the major issues that are contributing to um, the, the violent crime that is happening. And so we would use our, our implementation includes um, mobile camera trailers and um, pole cameras and information sharing and trying to use those uh, new technologies um, to help address some of the issues while also identifying hot spots and going through crime analysis and, and trying to figure out where we could implement new strategies. Um, and so that's where POP, uh, Problem Oriented Policing, comes in, is being able to identify the problem, look for solutions, and, and implement those solutions. Thank you. And, and you kind of covered, but uh, more specifically, how are you going to introduce the concept or how have you introduced the concept of POP into the department? So we started off with a, um, a brief survey of our um, agency, uh, giving them um, some information and letting them re or read over and answer questions that they believe would be the problems that the department faced. Um, just introducing the idea of looking for problems and looking for um, the issues that our, our, our communities face. But we've also began implementing um, some, some different strategies, but also including uh, our training and technical assistance from 
the National Policing Institute. And I think in a, com in a couple of weeks, Julie is going to be coming down and introducing uh, some more thorough ideas. But I attended the um, problem-oriented policing conference this year and gained so much information about um, different strategies and different implementations in other areas uh, similar to mine um, and also in, in other areas where it's a lot bigger and they have more resources or have different problems. But a lot of times it's some of the same problems and same solutions that we would implement. So as we progress, I hope to to build on that knowledge base that I have and help to share that with the officers that are interested in, in seeing this uh, problem-oriented policing implemented. Thank you. And it was wonderful to uh, see you and have you at the problem-oriented policing conference. I actually convened a small group of small and rural agencies. And so it was very interesting to hear the different challenges and we'll be I'll be talking about that in as a future part of the training after uh, these interviews are done. Uh, last question for you, and again, you kind of touched on it. What role do you see the technology deployments such as the mobile camera trailer and cameras playing in your planning and implementation of POP? Well, there, there's a there's a concept uh, called crime prevention through environmental design. Um, that is that is going to be huge, um, I believe, going forward, especially for rural communities like ours, where if you if you put um, if you put an officer on the street and, and he goes out and he does random patrols through areas, once the officer leaves that area, they know that they're fair. I mean, everything's fair game for at least another 30 minutes to an hour. But if you you actually implement some some environmental design that prevents some of those things from happening, putting a camera trailer in a, in a location or putting up permanent pole cameras, um, sharing information with other agencies and using that information to, to identify violators and, 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 go, and go after prosecuting violators. All those things uh, incorporated together will help to cut down on the number of violent crimes that are being committed in our city. And we recognize that after, uh, or I was talking to another chief in our sister city who was um, saying cameras are the way, way to go. I mean, you can put up eight or 10 cameras for around $40,000 and you've identified a lot of areas and cut down a lot of problems in those areas. So it's, a, it's an investment that it, you don't have to increase the number of officers that you have on patrol and actually gives them the information that they need when they're responding to a, a, a situation. Thank you very much. Uh, shifting over to Chief Lowell, your first question. So describe your department's relationship with the Central New York Crime Analysis Center and the support that was provided for your RVCRI project. So things were uh, in 2019, 2020 blossoming and uh, this project came along kind of at the right time where we were engaging the Crime Analysis Center. New York State has regional crime analysis centers and uh, throughout the state, which are funded in part through HIDA and in part through the New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services, or DCJS. And so they offer services that are free. We just have to engage the resource and request the work uh, from them or request the product. Uh, and what I mean by a product is for the way we engage them is we were seeking hotspot mapping and analysis of certain offenses over certain years. So we uh, engaged them to ask, what can we look at and what can you give us? So we looked at assaults, burglaries, criminal possession of weapons and robberies over initially the course of five years. Uh, based on that, they were able to give us a map. They were able to break down the days and times that these crimes were happening, which was surprisingly the middle of the week, uh, where we seemed to trend in a, in a direction that we would have thought, well, geez, well, it has to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or sometime in there, but it, the data didn't support that. Uh, so based on the map that the Crime Analysis Center provided, we were able to structure with the, upon receipt of the grant, hotspot patrols within these specific areas um, based on that, on that mapping. Uh, but the Crime Analysis Center is great. Uh, they have access to 
license plate reader um, data through across the across the state and through HIDA. They have access to several different reporting uh, record management systems um, and just a tremendous amount of resources within one area that they're a great partner for us to have uh, regionally and across the state so that uh, oftentimes we'll have people coming into our area, either from, like I mentioned, Syracuse or Utica, um, or even down from New York City, uh, running drugs or, or anything like that. And so to be able to engage them as a partner has been absolutely huge uh, for our agency. Yeah, I'm not sure if you know how spoiled you are having the regional crime analysis centers, but uh, it's a very unique thing throughout the United States and a, a wonderful thing for the smaller agencies to have that resource. Yes. But... Next question. So how did your department prepare the patrol officers for deployment in your project hotspots? So after we were awarded the grant funding, we had a loose structure um, so loosely structured program. So like I had mentioned previously, we had tried to roll out hotspot patrols, but it was really ad hoc. It was based on uh, hunches rather than actual data of when crime was occurring. And it was um, so inconsistent. So um, we prepared by first sending officers through uh, formalized training, again, offered by the state. Um, it was a few day course called Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Um, like the chief had mentioned. And then also uh, we had sent, I had attended a 10-week course for evidence-based policing strategies through DCJS, but it was put on by uh, Chris Coper and Cynthia Lum from George Mason University. So that really shaped how to view evidence-based policing. It provided a, a big playbook, uh, that's their term, and, uh, and helped us to really get down do a deeper dive into how to structure the program, which we ended up writing written directives, um, really being focused within these specific hotspot areas based on the mapping product that was provided. Great. Um, also, oh, oh, no, it's okay. We also worked with our training and technical assistance provider. They were fantastic. LISC uh, helped us roll out four short videos uh, for officers to view prior to working the overtime details within the specific hotspots. And those four videos were uh, based on, were SEPTED videos. We made them short, down and dirty, uh, to prime the officers to get thinking about SEPTED. So we didn't have to uh, send people to a multi-day course, but they got the principles behind it. So when they went out and worked the patrols, they were able to, uh, one, one of the directives was to engage the public, uh, track who you engage with, and then bring back feedback. Crime stats tell us a very narrow piece of the pie. Uh, the other thing we wanted to gauge is the feel of crime or the feel of safety within certain areas. And what does the public see within those certain areas? And what can we bring back and look at to truly engage crime prevention through environmental design as a, as a concept and, and live it? That's great, thank you. Last question for you. So could you briefly describe any additional city or community partnerships that have been developed to assist with problem solving for your project? So as we uh, were developing the project and starting to roll out deployments uh, in the hotspot areas, we engaged, we started to engage a whole host of city departments, uh, city codes, the fire department, the fire marshal's office, parks and rec, DPW, and city planning. Uh, as we went through the process uh, and we had multiple deployments that had occurred. We tracked the data. Um, we had our certified officers go out and do SEPTED analysis within the hotspot areas. They came up with a written report and things that needed to be addressed by codes, the fire marshals, parks and rec, TPW and planning to get the, those were the stakeholders and have the buy-in from those entities to make those corrections. We recognized going into this project, not everything has to or should be a law enforcement problem. We were just left coordinating the project, which was fine when we started to get buy-in, which seemed to be one of the biggest pieces, uh, pieces was coordinating all of the efforts and making sure people were following up and doing their piece of the pie um, was, was good. It was kind of like herding cats at first, but what, as they started to see the changes that were uh, occurring in their area, the more buy-in that they got and the response from the community uh, was was really good. We also were 
partnered with Syracuse University. So the other piece of this through SEPTED is community engagement. Um, as a component, so we partnered with Syracuse University so they could study how the City of Oneida Police Department interacts with the community. And uh, they implemented uh, surveys of their own and they came back and with feedback on, on how we, we uh, interact with the community. And that has morphed into further involvement and now they are helping us develop strategies to for campaigns to continue to involve. And one of the things that we'll be implementing is a police department app uh, to provide access to uh, people who don't use Facebook, which is the largest platform that police agencies seem to be using and then Instagram. But uh, we recognize that we had issues and holes with community communicating with the community as a whole. And we wanna hit all the age groups uh, a little bit better and be approachable in their world. Um, the second, Partnership is with the New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services to expand our research efforts and how to take a deeper dive into uh, the indicator crimes or indi indicator offenses or call types for our serious offenses. So we're going to look at things like how does mental health play into this and how are our drug abuse or substance abuse disorders playing into this. Uh, again, going back to we know they're a contributing factor, but how how much? And how do we align people with resources? And can we now get down, uh, go down the path of setting people up with resources preemptively to reduce crime? And what stakeholders can we engage there? Um, so those are the, some of the partnerships that we've been able to engage and, and are working with. Thank you. And I think, you know, super important and over the history of problem-oriented policing and problem solving, that really, I mean, most of the agencies that have really successfully solved problems have partnered a lot with other city, community, and researcher agencies. So nice that you highlighted that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, last question. I'm going to shift back to Chief Stanford. What is one piece of advice you would give other small and rural agencies about implementing problem analysis or problem-oriented policing? Me unmute. Uh, the uh, the one piece of advice that I would give to a, an agency that that is uh, looking to implement some. Uh, I mean, we've got to get out of the insanity loop. Um, continuing to do the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different res a result. It, as an agency, that's the problem that we faced, that we dealt with, um, and we still deal with it. And it's just that that old school mentality that, I mean, all I've got to do is respond, uh, take a report and go back to the station and, and type up a nice report and then go back out and, and catch the next call. It, it shouldn't be that. It should be let's let's identify a problem, see the problem, and and find look to find solutions. Uh, partner with your communities, partner with uh, your citizens and the people in your in your area that that do have uh, other thoughts, that do have um, some ideas, and, and look to other places. And don't be afraid of grants. Reach out and and apply because. It, you may not realize it, but they're not as hard as everybody makes them out to be. And when you do, put all of your effort into doing that and go after it and 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 be ready to to put some work and effort into to implementing those new strategies. Thank you. Chief Lowell. Uh, I think that Chief set set uh, set me up for a good a lot of good talking points. So I appreciate that. Uh, going back to grants, engage what you can. And uh, if you're in a position in your agency to be a leader, to uh, research what what is available and how can you best utilize it for your department. We use things, uh, technology, I agree with uh, the chief in that it's a huge asset, but what, to what extent can you truly use that and optimize that piece of equipment? And it's got to be an evidence-based strategy within your department has to be at all levels, it just can't be the administration. It's got to be rolled out to your to your people. Uh, training is huge, and uh, I guess the overarching thing is uh, Chief Stanford had, had touched on it. The view. Um, one of the things that was difficult for our agency 
as a new concept is the to be proactive. We'll go out and be proactive. If we were to, as a sergeant or lieutenant or chief say, go out and be proactive, everybody has a different idea of what proactivity is. And traditionally as an industry, myself as a young cop, being proactive was going out and responding to the speeder and writing the ticket or going out and making drug arrests for the hand-to-hand -hand that just happened. Uh, but truly being proactive is going out and, and identifying the underlying causes and attacking the problems from that angle and being proactive to prevent the crime before it happens, or at least the contributing factors of crime before they happen. And getting that to be a concept and have people engage when they have discretionary time to be proactive and um, and, and look at things through a different lens is, is a big piece of advice. And like uh, the chief said, we have to reframe uh, how we view crime as a whole and our responses to crime just because we've done it this way for 30 or 40 or 50 years, it might have worked, but uh, it's not working any longer. So we really have to look at how, how we're changing what we're doing. A wonderful way to end. Uh, thank you, Chief Stanford and Chief Lowell, uh, for your time and uh, input, and also especially for your leadership, because I think, as you both said, it's super important for the leader to really understand to get the cops below him or her to be doing something different than we've always done. Thank you again to the chiefs for that excellent discussion. So when we say what makes small and rural different, we mean different than the midsize and larger and or urban and suburban agencies and jurisdictions, with the obvious being the population and the size of the agency. In terms of crime, we often see less serious crime problems rising to the top. What I mean by this is if you look up at all the top calls or crime types, you don't see the same types of violence, shootings, and other types of serious crime as the most common as we see in other types of agencies. Also, with a lower number of calls and crimes, in other words, the data that are used to identify trends and clusters, it is harder to see these trends and clusters with that lack of data. Lastly, most larger agencies have analysis resources to support the identification and understanding of crime problems, as well as the ability to assess crime reduction efforts. While we heard how fortunate Oneida, New York, and other small and rural agencies in New York State are with their regional analysis centers, this is unique across the United States. So in most small and rural communities, either one of the officers has to take this on, which no one has time for, nor is trained in, or it's only done on an ad hoc basis, if at all. What are the most common crime and disorder problems that small and rural jurisdictions face? Based on both data and discussions with numerous agencies from around the country, these were drugs, theft, domestic abuse, and quality of life issues. As we always talk about in problem analysis and problem-oriented policing, these are still broad categories and need further analysis to determine the underlying issues locally. For instance, the problem of drugs could range anywhere from juveniles smoking marijuana after school to people obtaining opioids from pharmacies through burglaries or robberies and then reselling those drugs. Theft can range anywhere from bicycles being stolen from residential yards to a very different problem of shoplifting, whether it's tools or alcohol or jeans. In terms of domestic abuse, many states include family and roommates in that category, which is obviously a very different problem than intimate partner violence. Quality of life issues range from excessive noise to litter to abandoned properties serving as opportunities where other problems often occur. The takeaway is that no matter your size or the type of crime, further analysis is always very important. In terms of unique challenges that small and rural communities face, we've highlighted the most common. As noted earlier, a lack of internal resources is extremely important. This goes beyond analysis expertise to other resources such as grant writers or other personnel that are focused on non-direct policing functions. 
The funding that is available is often harder to find and get, although a shout out to BJA for this specific funding and other upcoming opportunities that are focused on small and rural. Training is also less readily available and small and rural often have to travel further distances, which then in turn increases costs and the time away. When an agency only has eight officers, even losing one officer for a couple days of training offers a huge challenge. The next one, that most universities and other researchers have traditionally supported the larger agencies, although this could definitely be improved with awareness on both the agency and the researcher sides. Lastly, rural agencies often have large areas of coverage with a limited number of patrol officers. Not only is response time affected, but identifying the trends and problems as well. I did some work years ago on vehicle theft in rural North Carolina. The police would take the incident report with the address of the house or the farm, wherever the vehicle was stolen, and these were then mapped. In this study, researchers went back out to each crime location, asked the victim specifically where on the property the vehicle was stolen from, and then remapped those locations using GPS or the lat long of that location. This presented a very different picture than we originally saw. To wrap up, we wanted to provide you some resources for further learning. In the first bullet, this is a chapter entitled Operationalizing Community Policing in Rural America, Sense and Nonsense, by Gary Cordner and others at Eastern Kentucky University. This is from a larger publication called Community Oriented Policing and Problem Solving Now and Beyond. The second bullet is Evidence-Based Crime Reduction Strategies for Small, Rural, and Tribal Agencies. This was a COPS office publication that funded IACP to create. The third bullet is a slide deck or presentation from Mansfield, Massachusetts, presentation to the 2022 International Problem-Oriented Policing Conference. And the last two bullets are pages that you can follow or sign up for updates to hear more about available funding, both from BJA and the larger Office of Justice programs. Thank you very much and good luck with your problem analysis.